Hello and welcome all, one and all to Kerbal Space Program. But this is not just ordinary Kerbal Space Program. As you'll probably pick up on pretty quick here, uh, maybe you already have, judging by that tiny, thin little rocket fuel tank for those of you that have played the regular game. But as this video progresses, you'll probably all realize soon that this is uh, a little different than what we're used to with KSP. This is going to be, I hope, a series of videos that I'm probably going to call something really creative like Realistic Space Program. And that's because it's going to be a space program that's incredibly realistic. Well, it's going to be realistic. What it's not going to be is super hyper realistic. Um, what you're going to see here, this is a reenactment that's playing under my voice here right now of uh, the rockets I used to do my first few flights in this. I'm, I'm sort of catching up. I started doing this and then decided, let's make some videos out of it. And that's what you're seeing here. I'm reenacting my first few flights. This one was an upper atmosphere probe. It's using basically the stock Stay Putnik satellite probe core except it has an added function with all of the mods that I've got in that the Mark I version does upper atmosphere science and it's a, a different sort of upper atmosphere science. Um, you'll see more on that later. Uh, you might you might pick it up. It's sort of it happens all pretty fast. This is four times time accelerated. But uh, you might notice if you're really quick or if you're pausing the video that at some point when I get with a probe up to where it needs to be, I'm activating a data recorder. And so what these do, they literally they just gather up data as a resource, and then you spend that saved up data to do atmospheric or orbital samples. So it's, it's a new sort of, it's a new way of collecting science. Uh, it helps bring this more in line with the set of mods that I've got. Because with the mods that I've got, you're probably, probably noticing that back there, that uh, that was Florida. I'm launching from Cape Canaveral, which is definitely not on Kerbin. I've got the real solar system mod. So this is Earth, full size. You can see I'm approaching 170 kilometers, 180 kilometers, and now I'm finally in space. Not 69 kilometers like Kerbin, 180 is how high you have to get. And so that, that little guy there is now doing low orbit science for me. And uh, you collect a lot more. You see zeros there, because of course I'm reenacting. But I think uh, a, a low space reading got me 50 or 75 science, which sounds like a lot. But I'm also in my large package of mods using uh, a tech tree mod, which is sort of designed to work with the real solar system and realism overhaul and all that sort of group of mods made by uh, the wonderful KSP modder and enthusiast Nathan Kell. And of course, you know, I will show you that tech tree in this video. Uh, you'll see that there are things are separated into a lot more different branches. Um, there, it's a little more it's a little more sorted into what types of things you want to unlock. And uh, it also has integration for various other more popular mods, some of which are required by the realism overhaul in the real solar system, others of which are just simply popular, like uh, KSP Interstellar is integrated into this tech tree. Kerbal Attachment System um, is integrated into this tech tree. Uh, what else? I mean, B9 Aerospace stuff. All, all, the, all of the popular, all the, all the most popular, or most of the most popular, mod packs, um, which, you know, will serve to kind of enhance the overall realism, because that's what obviously this is all about. It's the realism overhaul, and I'm going to be doing what I hope to be a realistic space program. And, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be super realistic. One thing, there's several things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to just straight up copy real life rockets. Uh, I'm not going to simply do all of the exact things that say NASA did or any particular space agency did. I'm going to do things a little bit in my own order. It's going to be close, obviously. I mean, there are certain things you kind of want to do first. You want to get 
you want to get yourself good at orbits, you want to build rockets that can put things into orbit, and then you can work on putting people into orbit. So the, the progression of it is going to probably be fairly similar. And, you know, when I eventually get to the point where I'm sending Kerbals to the moon, um, my rocket may well end up looking a lot like, uh, you know, a Saturn V, the Apollo launch vehicle. But that I'm not going to copy. I might imitate, because obviously that worked. So mine might be similar, because why change a good thing? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm not looking to reenact reality. This is going to be my own version. Uh, one difference that you're seeing there, there's already some stuff in orbit as I'm as I kind of film these reenactment flights. Uh, so I've, I've already got some comm satellites in orbit. They're not in great orbits, but, you know, I'm, I'm working on it. And that you will see. I want to have a communications network of some sort before I start sending people up into space. Uh, in real life, I believe the first few manned flights, you know, they were just... They were communicating with ground stations. They just set up ground stations all over the world. And they were communicating in that way because there weren't communication satellites all over the place everywhere. Um... But of course, you know, you will see that and a whole lot more. Hopefully you'll see a whole entire, like I said, realistic space program that will go beyond where ours is today. I, I want to get into the KSP Interstellar stuff. I'm going to go maybe all the way to warp drive in a real solar system setting. So it's going to be fun, I hope. But first, I just wanted to take you through the solar system that I'll be working with and that you'll be seeing. It's by the name the real solar system or at least a realistic one. In general I've done a pretty damn good job too. Uh, I'm actually using the configuration which is a bit more than just the current base version of the real solar system mod. Uh, someone has done a configuration that uses some of the extra planets that were done in the Planet Factory mod uh, in order to flesh things out a bit and give us, I think, one or two planets that we were still missing and a bunch of moons. Which is neat. You can see Kerb in there and there's the moon. The moon is full size, 21 whatever hundred kilometers across. Um, got about the same gravity as the one we're used to, but uh, it's a hell of a lot farther away from Kerbin than we're used to. Our moon is, you know, 360-ish thousand kilometers away from Earth, and so that's what you deal with in the real solar system setup. You've got the moon where it belongs, and it's as big as it should be, and has an inclined orbit and all of that too. Actually, I think the moon orbits kind of on the same plane as like the rest of the solar system does, basically, but it's just that Earth is tilted, so in order to make it look like that, they've just kind of tilted the moon's orbit. And now we're into Mercury here, and I've got textures for place too, as you can tell by that nice little glitchy line on there. Um, but that is that's a Mercury texture. That's Moho standing in for Mercury, um, looking pretty good though, even with the glitch. I do like it. Um, it's it's what Mercury should look like. And since we're doing a real solar system mod, might as well have our stand-in moho look the way it should. And uh, we move out to Eve here pretty soon. Oh, maybe we don't. I'm Obviously I'm voiceovering this after the fact. I can't remember exactly when. Here we go. Now I'm finally taking us to, to Eve. And of course we get in close and it's not purple, it's kind of Venus colored. Uh, we should be seeing like the hazy atmosphere over it, but you know, of course, I, I I couldn't get, I can't quite get the clouds, volumetric clouds, uh, add-on stuff working properly. Um, the environmental visual enhancements mod, it's a great thing, and I've seen some very pretty screenshots and video clips, but I'm just not getting it to work quite well. Same with uh, you know, Duna here, standing in for Mars. There should be some clouds. You should be seeing a little more, I don't want to say redness, but you should be seeing a little more atmosphereness. And there's definitely an atmosphere there, and you can see it's it's a bit thicker. It's certainly a bit thicker than Duna's. 
Uh, it's you know, it's actually it's it's still very thin pressure wise. It's taller, I should say. So we've got Phobos and Deimos, Deimos, uh, Mars's moons. Using some of the little stock KSP moons to stand in for those. We've got inaccessible. Is currently what is in I think inaccessible. Well, it's inaccessible and Minmus are both. Uh, little the little asteroid well the big asteroids in the asteroid belt some of the really big ones that we've actually named inaccessible I think is Vesta and Minmus is uh, is Sarah's and I'm pretty sure I, I guess they've got the the stats I don't know how big Sarah's actually is I'm gonna trust that they've respect Minmus to be the right size of course it's still shaped like Minmus but now it's colored like Sarah's and it's the size of Sarah's. Here we got Jupiter. Still has a bit of its lingering jewel-like glow, but it's unmistakably Jupiter with the new texture I've got in there, and I'm liking that. Uh, Paul is Io. We've got Elu standing in for Europa, which is quite nice. Elu kind of looks like Europa anyway, but that's a new texture. It's more Europa-like. I'm quite a fan of it, even with all the texture compression I've got to do to get KSP to run with all this stuff. Uh, Ganymede, Tylo standing in for Ganymede, and Ike playing the role of Callisto. So Jewel, uh, Jupiter is kind of a lot like Jewel is. We got a bunch of moons there to go to. Uh, Centaur is a planet from the Planet Factory pack. Retext to look like Saturn. It's doing a good job playing its role. Val has been seriously shrunk, I think, and it's playing the role of Enceladus. Aaron is our Titan for this adventure, and uh, Ringle, which I guess has a ring, but I don't think should in our solar system, in its job playing uh, Iapetus, Iapetus. But anyway, we'll live with it. It's just a ring. Can't win them all. Uh, Skelton is our Uranus, or Uranus, if you'd prefer. And look at the tilt on those moons. Uh, we have... Oh, what am I doing here? What was I thinking? I guess I'm going back to look at look at Uranus. I just love looking at Uranus. Ablate is our... What is that one? Miranda. Which is one of the moons. And the other one there is... I think that's... We're still looking at Ablate which starts off its life in the regular planet factory and stock KSP being closer to the sun than Moho. So I guess it's it's a playing on the fact that it's probably being burned up by the sun's heat and ablated. There's Thud, I think named for the sound you make when you first try to land on it, because it's usually got fairly high gravity and no atmosphere. But it has been repurposed, and it's playing the part of Titania in our realistic solar system. Eventually, maybe, if I get around to it. I guess I'm having a look. There we go. Lather, formerly, the artist formerly known as Lather, one of Jewel's moons, is now complete with its old Lather esque land masses. It's trying its best to play the role of Neptune. It's going to be interesting to see if you can actually land on those land, if, if it's still land masses or if that's just the, the bump map, texture map, kind of being weird. And there is Triton, is the actual Ascension, I think, is a planet pack, a planet factory pack body. Uh, it is sitting in as Triton, the moon of Neptune. And then, once I find it, I'm looking for. I'm just. <laughs> I'm making sure I don't lose count of the planets here at this point. And there's Drez, which has been reskinned and resized as Pluto. And out there next to it, I think I'm trying to focus on it for you, and I'm having a hard time. So then I'm killing time by talking about Pluto some more. But out there orbiting it is Charon, Pluto's moon. And that is another one of the planet factory bodies, Pock, which is our Charon. That bright magenta one, uh, I think that's Joker. Yeah, that's Joker in the planet factory pack. We are using it as Eris, one of those kind of extra planet 
ish bodies that's actually way out beyond the solar system and no one tends to think of. Sirius, um, when I get around to it and zoom in, it's going to look kind of surprising. It's sitting in for Sedna. I initially thought it might have been a comet with its orbit like that, uh, but no, it's it's Sedna, and look at that, it's... I, I thought I had accidentally focused on the sun, honestly. It's it's a star. Um, I, I suppose in the planet pack, Sirius is another star, kind of like Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, uh, in real life, maybe. Uh, but it's, despite it looking like a star, it's sitting in for... Sedna, uh, and I'm going to be very mighty interested in seeing whether or not I can uh, set something down on that. That's going to be a good one. And here is the tech tree, at least as much of it as I have on lock, at the point where you're finding me, I suppose, after the first few flights that I showed you earlier in this video that I had redone for your benefit to show I mean it really did only take just those few flights um, there might I think there was one failed attempt to establish a complete orbit in between but um, I mean that, that's that's the thing at, at the starting tech levels it's not really that hard just as it isn't in the stock game you just slap a nose cone and a SAS module or something something or a probe core or whatever that's unmanned or even a Kerbal in the pod onto the top of a rocket and just fire it straight up and you can get into space. So it didn't take very long for me to get something into space and get that science. And this stuff didn't cost that much. You know, the this one that I haven't unlocked yet, the early solid rocket boosters, 50 science. It's not a big deal. And it, it, was, it was one of the most expensive at this tech level. This tech level one, which you can see in the description. This, the basic rocketry, the uh, liquid-fueled stuff, it was 10. Early engineering was 10. Early staging was, I think, 25. Control systems was 10 or 25. So there's a lot of that, but it ramps up quite quickly. This costs 10. The next one costs... Actually, no, this one costs 50. Liquid-fueled rockets, tech level 1, costs 50. The next one costs 500. This one here, I think, costs 10. The next one costs 50. Uh, this one here, I think, was 25, or maybe it was 10. This one's 50. Here you've got 250, so I think this one was 25, and the next one, tech level 2, is 250, so it ramps up quite a bit. And it's all just, you know, between the amount of science stuff costs and the amount of science you earn doing stuff, it's more balanced toward progressing in a way similar to how we did in real life. You know, with what we learned from sending rockets into suborbital paths, we learned what it was going to take to send a person in a rocket to a suborbital path. So, you don't need to send a satellite to Mars to know how to send a person to orbit. And it's, it's more balanced that way. So down here on the right is, this is most of your rocket building stuff, and then everywhere else you either kind of get support stuff or science gathering stuff. You, know, you get batteries and solar panels and lights, landing legs, ever more advanced probe cores and communications equipment. Of course I have remote tech running on this too, so I've got to make sure I've got some good satellite dishes so stuff can be controllable, let alone beam its science information back home. And here you go, science instruments, ever more advanced science instruments. Up this way, we'll eventually, I'm sure, get manned pod type of stuff. So uh, once we research some of this, and this is 500 science before I can get a command pod. Just a one-man command pod, or a one Kerbal command pod. So it's actually going to be a while before I can do any kind of, you know, a Mercury mission, John Glenn, first man in space kind of stuff. Or first, no, oh, whatever. We'll just pretend. And then ever more advanced. You start off a supersonic flight here. You get basically space planes is what you get out of this once you advance up through it. Uh, bigger and better plane stuff so you can build a space shuttle if you want. 
over here on the left is kind of a funny little tech node. Things that don't work. It actually costs one science. I guess if it costs zero science, it would start unlocked. And this is where anything that the tech tree designer knows just does not work in the realism overhaul or in the real solar system or with the way he has his science working. He throws it in here in the things that don't work category. And that is so far just the AIES uh, aerospace science instruments, which is fine because I have science, stock science instruments, which do all the same thing. And I'll get the other ones up here. So whatever. I just find that kind of amusing. Things that don't work. We'd like to spend some of our hard-earned R&D money on things that don't work. But anyway, we're not going to spend any hard-earned R&D on things that don't work, at least until we can afford it. In the meantime, let's maybe see if I can uh, fly a rocket for you guys. Or, you know, it's never too early to get off on the right foot of keeping my videos in nice, palatable chunks for you guys. So, since I'm seeing that we're already well past 21 minutes at this point, I think I'll have to fly a rocket for you guys next time. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.